hate to ask you this, but do you think you could give me a ride? Okay, cowboy, you got yourself a ride. Um, get in. He's in the Marine Corps. No shit. First Force Recon. Last unit to leave Vietnam, April 71. I got the same one right here. <laughs> Thanks for the ride. Anytime, soldier. Anytime. Then I want to buy you a drink. Oh, thanks, but I, I should get going. The least I can do is buy you a beer. Thanks, but I should get my car. I'll tell you what. Let me buy you a beer, and then I'll help you get your car. Really, it's okay. You don't want to drink with me? Us Marines, we got to stick together. Come on! Okay, soldier, you're right. I can get my car later. That's it? <laughs> That's more like it. Five minutes later. I know that some of you over the past few episodes have been wondering about the mental state of the Rudy Land gang, asking questions like, what are they talking about? Why are they always rambling? Are they suffering from dementia? So we have taken the proper precautions and each of us have taken an acuity test and the results are finally in. And yes, in fact, we do have dementia. Boat, cucumber. Boat, cucumber. I don't know the third one. Oh, you got two out of three. <laughs> That's why we're reviewing Michael Haneke's Amour from 2012, a hilarious romantic comedy about an elderly man taking care of his wife who suffered a massive stroke and witnessing her slow mental decline. What hijinks will ensue? Don't touch that dial. So what did we watch? Uh, we watched Red Rock West directed by John Dahl and starring Nicolas Cage and Dennis Hopper and J.T. Walsh and uh, Laura Flynn Boyle. What are some positives you have about this film, other than it being really, really, really similar to Blood Simple? Well, I like these types of films. The twisty, turny, neo-noir films. That's exactly how I described it, neo-noir they just create a really great sense of atmosphere. And I like that they always start out simple and then things just constantly get more complex and complicated. The pieces kind of fit into the jigsaw puzzle. It's always kind of like a slow descent into hell for these characters. You just love slow descents into hell, don't yes, you? Yes, I, I really do. I love when characters go through horrific, horrific things. Movies. I don't know what that says about me. <laughs> I like that this is the first time Nicolas Cage plays a disgraced Marine. I like it only took place in, you know, one day, two days, basically. I mean, uh, was he really a disgraced Marine? I don't, I don't know if he was disgraced. No, come on, I'm trying to sew the threads here. You, you're poking <laughs> holes in my, in my goddamn cardigan. All right. What was the next time he was a disgraced Marine? That would be Con Air. I just saved your life. My mama lives in a trailer. Put the bony back in the bar. He, did he talk the same as he did in that movie? In this movie, the same as Con Air? I think it was my, slightly different, but I got it kind of hit the same notes. His, his accent in Con Air is way, way different, way more over the top. Nothing, I was just admiring your cage. Fits you pretty good. I'm looking for work. I love Conair. Conair is a blast. Pretty good. Yeah, it's it's a the Don Simpson, Jerry Bruckheimer era. Yeah, it's like if Michael Bay made a good movie. <laughs> Wait, is that even possible? Yeah. Well, I mean, I I like I like Bad Boys one and two, but they're not exactly world fine class cinema. Absolutely not. So let's uh, let me let me briefly tell you the things I didn't like about this movie. Okay, without without spoiling it. 
It is a twisty, turny neo-noir, except it's not really that complex or complicated. Everything was pretty obvious. Everything that was going to happen was pretty obvious what that was. I think maybe for one character, you kind of know where the beats are going, but I think there's a really, really kind of massive surprise 30, 40 minutes in that uh, I didn't think that was telegraphed at all. But If it's what I was thinking of, I, I didn't see it at first, but I wasn't shocked. There was a certain, certain thing that happened that made me think, oh, okay, that's definitely going to be that guy. Okay. Oh, we'll definitely get into that in spoilers. What are some things you didn't like about this movie, or are you completely in love with it? No, I'm, d- I'm definitely not in love with it. I really love the first 40 minutes of the movie, and then it has a lag in the middle, and I don't think it quite crosses the finish line, but it's, it's definitely a really enjoyable movie. I like the performances. I really like the score of the movie. It's got an ominous vibe to it. There's a lot of great guitar work. The, uh, the guy who did the score, actually, he didn't really do many films. His name was William Olvis. He, he basically scored the, I don't know if you ever saw the old TV show, Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, back in the 90s. Dr. Quinn Medicine Pussy. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to watch that show back in the day, so it was kind of interesting that he did the score for that. But I, I really like the score. I like the cinematography. I can get more into the cinematography and spoilers because there's kind of reoccurring themes with some cinematography. I will say I'm kind of mixed on Laura Flynn Boyle in this movie. She's, I like her in certain points of the movie. I have to kind of tap dance around it. But when you first meet her, there's not really a super a lot to her character. It's like a standard noir stuff. She's just the girl. So definitely not perfect, but I, I really did. I had a good time watching. I really liked that. It only took 10 minutes and that's the movie got started. You knew everything you need to know about Nick Cage's character. Right. Yeah, that's that's the thing is that right at the beginning of the movie, give a little gist of the plot here. Um, you see him, you see that he's got a USMC tattoo, so you know he's a Marine. He's also showing you that he's got this bum knee, so he's had an injury. He's just trying to get a job at an oil refinery. They won't hire him. He's only got five bucks in his wallet. He uses that five bucks to get into the town of Red Rock. And so it's just, we really get into everything quick. And there's not, there's not a bunch of exposition. It's just kind of shown you know, without dialogue, which, which I like. I don't give a shit about exposition. I just like that it got started. It's not a complex movie. It's just get into the story. You learn everything you need to know about him. Now let's get into the action. I mean, I guess that's general impressions. I would say if you got nothing else going on, and you need a good sort of early Coen-ish Brothers movie, give it a watch. It was good. Yeah, I I definitely recommend it to pretty much everybody. I think it's it's a really enjoyable movie. Obviously, if you like Nicolas Cage, this is one of his more obscure films. It's streaming on the horribly named Peacock Universal's app. Why don't they just call it NBC Universal or something? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I don't know. People who get paid a lot of money to sit in rooms, they came up with Peacock. <laughs> Don Draper himself came up with Peacock. I saw one in Nam. So watch if you want, and if you don't, I don't really care. <laughs> Boilers. <laughs> Nicholas Cage is a down on his luck former Marine involved in some kind of explosion and I don't know, I think he said Libya or Lebanon. Lebanon, pardon me. He ends up, his friend works on this oil rig, he's going to get a job there. Oh, he's got a fucked up leg, I can't take him, they'll take right. my insurance away. He's going to spend his last five bucks at a bar drinking coffee at nine or ten in the morning when the bartender, you the guy? You the guy for the job? Yeah, I'm the guy for the job. Little does he know, the job is killing the bartender's wife. Yeah. I... Laura Flynn Boyle. Yeah, I'm a sucker for the whole mistaken identity type thing. Hitchcock did a lot of that. I just, I like those mistaken identity movies. So I'm into that. Well, yeah, it, it works here, especially because we learn, okay, he's generally a good guy. He didn't take money from his friend. He goes to a gas station. There's an open register. Nobody's around. He could, he's only here? got five bucks. He's got to make it back to Texas or wherever. Right. 
and he doesn't touch the money. He thinks about it, though. He thinks about it. Yeah, he definitely does think about it, but he walks out. Yeah, he, the, the bartender sees the plates of his car, and he thinks he's Lyle from Dallas. You are here for the job, aren't you? And you're Lyle from Dallas, right? Right. Let me just first of all say, I watched, bought and watched Blue Velvet not long ago. Hustin, your love letter. Straight from my heart, fucker. Do you know what a love letter is? It's a bullet from my fucking gun, fucker. I love Dennis Hopper as an underworld figure. He's so great. He's cool, intimidating, but also he's very crazy. He's easily one of the top three for me crazy role actors. Like, number one, Jack Nicholson, only for The Shining if I had to pick one. You didn't let me finish my sentence. I said, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm just going to bash your brains in. I'm gonna bash him right the fuck in. <laughs> and uh, I had another one, but I forgot it. So let's skip that part. Yeah, no, Dennis Hopper is a great actor. There's definitely been some roles of his that just, he's horrible in Waterworld. Girl, I don't give a shit what he'd like. He took out my eye. And if I ever see him again, I'm gonna cut open his head and I'm gonna eat his brain. You think he'd like that? But uh, he's really good, and it's it's interesting you brought that up with the Blue Velvet because um, the director actually wanted Dennis Hopper to play the sheriff role. He could have pulled it off. I don't know if whoever they got to be Lyle would have done as good a job. I don't think right. so. The director wanted him to play the sheriff because he thought that Lyle was way too similar to the role in Blue Velvet. Dennis Hopper, he did not want to play the sheriff at all. He wanted to play Lyle. See, I like that. He did a great job as the character in Blue Velvet, and he did a great job as Lyle here. Yeah, when you first see his character, when Nicolas Cage almost gets run over, as soon as he steps out of that old car, it's just great. It's like, okay, you see the look on his face. He's got this incredible line, which he says when he almost runs over Nicolas Cage. Well, you're one lucky son of a bitch, aren't you? Huh? If I hadn't had my brakes just done, I'd be picking your brains out of my radiator. Really, it's okay. You don't want to drink with me? I'm not good enough to buy you a beer? No, 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 it's not that. I, I just... Well, then what the fuck's your problem? Yeah, he's, he's great in this movie. Along with Dennis Hopper, I loved Dwight Yoakam's exchange with him. Oh, yeah, as the, uh, as the truck driver. Yeah, he was great. What the hell are you doing on my truck? Sorry, boss. I didn't mean to scare you. Hey! I look scared to you. What the hell are you doing on my truck? I never knew that he was a country singer at all. Actually. Seriously? No, I, I've seen him in so many movies. You know, he's in Panic Room. Other movies? He's in, he's in, I can only recall Sling Blade and this. He was in Panic Room. He played the psycho in Panic Room. I never saw Panic Room. Yeah, he's good in Panic Room. It just seemed like a dumb concept to me. Well, I mean, it's David Fincher. You might as well give it at least one shot. Oh, David Fincher made it? Yeah, David Fincher made it. Do you think it's good? Uh, I rewatched it uh, maybe like a, a year and a half, two years ago. I, I'm not a big fan of it, but I definitely think it's worth a watch. Is it kind of the same thing as the social network? Like, yeah, everything's executed really well, but it's just, it's missing something? Yeah, I, I mean, that's probably a fair assessment. It's It's executed well, but it's just like, it feels like he's kind of slumming it, so... I really liked the, the the last song that's played um, during the credits, and that's by Dwight Yoke. It's uh, a thousand miles from nowhere, and I looked it up. And it's the demo version of the song because it was like I guess it was a hit song. I I really liked it. I'm not a big country guy, but it has um, a more old school kind of country in that kind of Johnny Cash kind of vein. Where it's it's not saying about Paps Blue Ribbon in your fucking pickup truck. It's got some heart. It's got some soul. Yeah, I really liked. It was a shock. I was like, I, I never realized he was um, a singer, and I I really did enjoy that, that song. Going back to the score, it didn't blow me away. It didn't. It felt like a John Carpenter score to me. You know the really? sort of Western guitar. The only time I really took note of it was when it was just a single guitar playing a song. And it made me think of, I think it was the Snake Plissken theme from 
either the first or the second one. I think the second one. Some of the dialogue was kind of cheap, kind of dumb. Let me five dollars. Five it is. What should I do? If I were you, I'd get a divorce. Get a divorce. Now, oh, see, I love that line. <laughs> I just thought it was I thought it was cheap and cliche. And then a, a false one that made me laugh. Tell me about Mexico. I was thinking about uh, of mice and men as soon as she said that. <laughs> Tell me about them rabbits, Dodge. Yeah, that's definitely the worst part of the movie is after they knock out Dennis Hopper. He throws a fucking statue at him. Right. After they knock out Dennis Hopper and then the whole pseudo love story happened. That's the lull of the movie for sure. I thought him throwing the money away was lame. Oh, at the end? But it's in his character. Yeah, I mean, it, I think it, it's kind of like, okay, this money is completely fucking cursed. And what I like is that when he throws all that money away and then he pushes her out of the... Uh, I did like the violence against Lara Flynn Boyle. I will admit oh, that. <laughs> he just tosses her from a moving train. Right, which, which is nice. But as fate or the gods intervene, $5,000 packet gets stuck in the train and that's his reward for all the hell he's gone through like i said earlier i like how it was just one or one and a half days i like sort of seamless time frames you know what i mean we're not jumping three weeks ahead two days ahead we know exactly how long it's been we know exactly what's going on when and where yeah i like movies like that there's a, where there's a short time frame even like ticking clock movies where they have a certain amount of time, accomplish a mission or whatever, and that's the whole movie. It gives a sense of urgency to the movie. To get it back to the cinematography, I like how he's stuck in purgatory and we keep cutting to Red Rock sign when he goes back and he's leaving and how it's like all lit up red. And Oh yeah, the, the movie looked great. Oh yeah, it, it was really well shot. And I do really like the director. Before this movie, he, had, he did a noir movie, I think it was in the late 80s. Val Kilmer, Kill Me Again, which I've seen, which is enjoyable. He did uh, Rounders, which is a good movie, good poker movie. He also did Joyride, which I'm a big fan of. Was Joyride the one with Buffalo Bill? Yes, yes. Uh, Paul Walker, Steve Zahn, and uh, Ted Levine, I believe is his name, who played Buffalo Bill. Candy (laughs) Kane. Yeah, and he also directed a whole bunch of episodes of Dexter. He's done a whole bunch of TV now. He really doesn't make films anymore, but he, he's a very successful TV director. So, I mean, I think he's, I think he has talent. It's said though, he's either through his own hands or through the hands of Hollywood bureaucracy found himself resigned to television work. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, the, the kind of movies that he wants to make are rarely very financially successful. I think L.A. Confidential is probably gets the most successful neo-noir movie as far as box office. So there's really not. It's a genre that I love, but it seems like it's uh, it was. I mean, noir was obviously huge in the 40s and 50s and everything like that as far as film but later on in the 80s and 90s it's never been a big box office draw which is uh unfortunate that more people don't like it because i think there's just a really incredible quality to it It it's thrilling it's tense there's mystery excitement yeah sudden realizations that the woman you just slept with she's just a fucking covetous whore (laughs) right which is the classic staple of noir is this woman who's treacherous who's got the man wrapped around her finger and uh, playing him like a fiddle he's that hopeless sap i love that kind of stuff since we're brushing up on it the obviousness since i mean i'll get into the obvious parts that well it didn't bother me it's it clearly telegraphed me what was going to happen first it turns out the bartender who accidentally hired Nicholas Cage to kill his wife is actually the sheriff. Right. I thought it was good, but they really telegraphed it with a letter. Hmm. Yeah, see, I, I didn't think that was telegraphed at all with the letter. I'll give you another example. After Lyle picks him up, he gets into his car, they start heading off. They zoom in, really focus hard on Lyle's car. What do they focus on? His Texas license plate. Now, given any other circumstance, it would be meaningless. It wouldn't mean anything. But what we just learned from the sheriff, the killer he hired is coming from Texas. So ipso facto, the plate only has meaning if it's Lyle. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm not picking up the connection here. I must be retarded. Well, do you remember they zoom in on the plate, some of your ominous music starts? At the beginning, yeah. On Nick Cage's car. No, 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 on Lyle's car. Oh, when he almost runs over Nick Cage, yeah. Yeah, right when he gets in the car and they start heading off, it zooms in on his plate. I mean, we've already found out that uh, J.T. Walsh was the sheriff because he's chasing after him. That's a different obvious thing I noticed. The When he puts the letter in the mail, lightning strikes like, oh, this is a big serious moment. The only thing that really surprised me, but not really, was that his wife killed the killed her lover. Yeah, that was that that one I thought I thought that was the obvious thing, like everything with her character. She's the femme fatale as all the noir films yeah, are. She's like I wanna say the chick from Chinatown, but she was completely innocent, if memory serves me correct. The obviousness it feels more like they were setups to me, like the couple things I mentioned earlier, when they finally get to the money and JT Walsh makes him in order to unlock the box, which he could have just stolen the box and shot it later or opened it later, but never mind. Yeah. Yeah. Dennis Hopper even says that, you know, I could just, I mean, it's obvious to me that the gun would be in the box that he buried. Yeah. And then, and that whole kind of climax, I'm, I'm very mixed on it. I, I think it, it feels kind of rushed. I mean, even Dennis Hopper's death is just like so ridiculous to me. He gets impaled on the military statue because there are some parallels. He was a Marine in Vietnam. Nicholas Cage is a Marine. He gets impaled by a soldier statue. So there's imagery there. He should have just died on the statue. The fact that he pulled himself out of the statue and then he gets shot like eight times by Laura Flynn Boyle is just, I was like, all right, okay, that's, that's kind of ridiculous. Even, even the statue thing, it was really awkward. Dennis Hopper is the upper hand. He's dragging Nick Cage over to impale him on the statue. And then just a split second, Cage grabs him, throws him on the statue. Yeah, that, that was, it was just awkward. It was like they were running out of time on set and days and they were just like all right we gotta kind of piece this together to wrap this up yeah he was very reminiscent to me not only of the blue velvet character he played but also sort of like anton chigurh oh from no country ruthless but could also be very social yeah i mean i i really like those characters like that and i think a lot of these noir new noirs the best role is always the villain they have a lot of material to kind of chew on do you agree with me that, well, who's the guy who played the bartender again? J.T. Walsh? J.T. Walsh, who is revealed to be the uh, the sheriff. I liked that, but I, as soon as he put the letter in, I'm like, okay, they're making a big deal out of this for a reason. The reason is, oh, I bet that guy's the sheriff. Yeah, I just, I did not get that at all. I did not see him and his wife being... Oh, the embezzlement? <laughs> Well, that, that's why I say about it getting complicated. It gets, it's just more and more things get added. It's like, okay, they embezzled this money at some type of mill. And then he bought a bar in this town. He basically paid for everyone's drinks so he could rig this election to become sheriff. He, he just charmed everybody and then ran for sheriff. Right, yeah. So there's a lot of layers to it, kind of stacking things on top of each other which I like slowly as the movie goes on. They're just adding more things, which I like. Oh, yeah. One more thing. Laura Flynn Boyle, when Nick Cage goes to Warner, because he realizes, I don't got the stomach for this. I can't kill this woman. Hey, your husband's trying to kill you, ma'am. Oh, I'll pay you double to kill him. Right. Yeah, that's great. Even then, I, I didn't see her as sort of the, as you say, the femme fatale. I sort of, okay. Maybe she just knows what kind of a bad dude he is, and she's like, he's never going to stop. i got to kill him. It wasn't until I found out that they both had robbed the mill, and she's like, That's not what you think. I can explain. It was Wayne. I had nothing to do with it. One day he comes home and says, pack your bags. The next thing I know, I'm on the FBI's most wanted list. What am I supposed to do, Michael? He's my husband. I was in love with Oh, yeah. She's definitely going to screw over Nick Cage first chance she gets. Pretty much as soon as the motel and everything like that. And it's like, okay, you know, your lover just died. Well, I mean, he's not dead. He's in too. the hospital. He's not, he's not dead. He's, he, he's, he did survive. He's, he's in the hospital, they say. So we'll correct that. She laid it on really, really thick. And that was when the chinks in her armor first became apparent to me. I wasn't convinced yet, but I was certainly like, 
on guard. She's not the greatest actress, and she was on Twin Peaks, which I'm not a super big fan of that show. So, but it does have a couple of connections, obviously, with David Lynch, with Dennis Hopper, and and her. But you know, there's a reason why she never really became like a, a big star or anything like that. She's she's kind of bland. She ended up on uh, an ABC courtroom show, The Practice, maybe. Oh yeah. It ran for like nine seasons, so she's not heard for money. Oh, I guess she did pretty well then. <laughs> One more, it was way too obvious for me. When Nick Cage first goes and stalks the woman, she's riding her horse, she meets up with her lover. They're at this trailer, and they look around really, really hard. Bitch, except for this one instance, you're in the middle of Montana. Would you ever have to look around before going into a trailer? Hmm. You know, surrounded by nothing? When was this? What part are we talking about? Right after he accepts the job, he gets his binoculars and he's watching her. Oh, okay. Right. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, I know what you're talking about now. This is one of those little nitpicky things that I noticed. Her and her lover are looking around like they're in the middle of New York City and they got to worry about who's watching them go into this trailer together. You're in the middle of fucking bumfuck Montana. Nobody's around except for this one time. Yeah, that, that didn't bother me, but I hear what you're saying. I really like that sequence as we were talking about uh, with Dwight Yoakam when he gets on the truck. I really like that sequence when Nicolas Cage gets out of the bathroom and he goes on the roof and then he's got to walk across that plank with his bum knee and get on top of the truck. That's, that's a nice little scene. It's really noirish because not only does he have to figure a way out, you can see Dennis Hopper and JT Walsh figuring out where'd this little cocksucker go. Yeah, and at that point, JT Walsh, you know, he's still kind of out of the loop there. The prison break scene, I really, I really like. It sort of reminds me of like spy movies. It's very, he knows exactly what he's doing. First, he looks around, make sure there's only one guy in there. Then he comes in, makes sure the guy's got his attention, blows him away. Okay, here's where the hiccup comes. Turns out there's five hundred thousand dollars left of the two million J.T. Walsh and his wife stole. All right, I'll give you a deal. I'll break you out of this here prison. You give me half that money. The one part about the climax, the ending that I liked, was Dennis Hopper, his gun is unloaded. J.T. Walsh has a gun on him. So what does he do? Throws a fucking knife at his neck. Right, yeah, he's got the knife right up his sleeve. Yeah, that was nice. But I even liked when J.T. Walsh says to him, oh, you know, you can't shoot me right here, otherwise the caretaker of the cemetery is going to hear it. Now, that was nice. It's smart filmmaking because why doesn't he just shoot him right there? Um, oh, the caretaker will wake up. They'll call the sheriff or whoever. They'll be there and thwart everybody. That's a clever scene. I like the fact, even though it is kind of maybe a little over the top, that the money's buried in a cemetery. It's kind of alluding that, okay, well, everything clearly is going to go bad here because we're in a cemetery right now with all these criminals. You know. It's the last place anybody would ever look. It is a good idea. Why couldn't Nick Cage just be like this kind of actor guy? I'm not saying he was great or spectacular, but he did, a, he did a pretty good job, I'd say. Would you? Oh, yeah. You know, this is definitely one of his most subdued performances. I mean, there's a couple moments where he screams and yells and, and punches the uh, roof of his car. But most of the time, he's really controlled in this movie. He's not out of control. He's definitely really good in this. I, I totally agree. I wish. I mean, I love Nicolas Cage, but he definitely... I mean, he's even come up with this whole term for his type of uh, performances. Uh, I can't even remember what he calls it, but it's some just like bizarre term, like Western Kabuki or some shit like what a that. Fucking asshole. <laughs> well, he's a he's just a very weird guy. He has a lot of weird sensibility. He's like, sewn totems and stuff into his clothes for certain performances. <laughs> he's, he's a weird guy, but I think that really brings out a lot of just really special moments in a lot of these movies. It can, or it can be so bad it's funny. Yeah, I'd still rather watch him give a performance than a lot of these just boring-ass actors. I know it's an acquired taste. Not everybody can handle the rage cage, as they call it. <laughs> <laughs> it's Nick the Rage Cage from Los Angeles, California. I mean, uh, I, I will say I do like the scene when J.T. Walsh has Nick Cage in his car. And, you know, he's got him handcuffed. That's a nice little action scene when 
you know, it's obvious he's going to try to kill him here. Yeah, even Nick Cage knows. Oh, yeah, you know, you can just tell. I really did like that scene. It was good. That may be, aside from the Dennis, anytime Dennis Hopper was there, that may be the best scene for me. You're in the middle of Montana, it's foggy, it's night, you can't really... Well, you can see stuff. That that was another good thing about this movie. There was a lot of use of, especially at the end, at the graveyard, very heavy shadows, very low light. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's just like the real great staple of um, just noir, just shadows. There's another really good shot when um, Laura Flynn Boyle and Nicolas Cage go back to J.T. Walsh's office which is in the back of the bar and they end up going into his closet and the closet has got kind of that shade to it. And so all these shadows are going through and it has that. that, um, It's one of those kind of closets where it's slits. Yeah. And that's, that's a staple of noir from forties and everything like that. Black and white. When you got the window shades and lights shining through and it's got the shadows all over the actor. I I'm a sucker for that kind of stuff. Yeah. It helps to definitely bring life life to a scene yeah and it's and and that scene's cool too because the deputies come in and at that point they found money in the car and you're like okay are these deputies gonna go bad but no you know they're taking their fucking sheriff straight in they're like no we're fucking arresting you they got the letter they figured i don't did they ever reveal how they figured out who he really was or yeah they have the wanted poster from the fbi it just came in like that day or pretty recently yeah, that came in. They've been looking for him for a while, I guess, and it made its way there. And so they put it right on his uh, his desk right there with the deputies. And I and I and I like I liked the deputies in general. I thought they had a yeah, they were they good. didn't get a lot of scenes, but um, and even the scene where uh, Dennis Hopper kills that one deputy inside the station. He's like, oh yeah, you're gonna, you're gonna have to wait a little minute. And Dennis Hopper's just kind of. He could just shoot him when he's on the phone. He's just kind of sitting right there. He's waiting, biding his time. And then he's like, oh, what can I help you with? He just fucking shoots her in the face. I mean, I guess that's all she wrote. There's not much depth to this movie. It's just a... It's just a fun ride. A really nice-paced neo-noir. It's like an hour and 35 minutes without the credits. You can't beat that. You can't beat that time. It's obviously not perfect. It's not as good as Blood Simple or other films of that ilk, but it's definitely kind of a hidden gem for sure, I would definitely say. Did you get the Blood Simple vibes as hard as I did? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You can't you can't ignore it, for sure. Especially with the whole cheating wife thing and the, the hitman kind of intrigue stuff. It's just completely got that Blood Simple vibe to it. So, full recommendation for me, um, Peacock app or find an illegal way to do it. Oh, FYI, the Peacock app, if you watch on your computer, it didn't account for ad blocker. So I'm not saying you should do this, but hey, maybe download ad blocker, watch all the Peacock, free Peacock you want. Hmm? Get all the get all the cock you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I definitely say check it out. Definitely check it out on the app because I tried to watch this movie you know, a while ago and Fortunately, on DVD, it's not in the correct aspect ratio. It's in the pan and scan. Um, there's no Blu-ray release. So it's it's nice that Universal put it in the correct aspect ratio for, for the app. And it, it, it looked really good. It looked like a nice, clean master. Like they had done like a new 2K scan of it. It looked good. Looked great. Yeah, and it came out in 93. So there's a lot of movies from that time that haven't been necessarily cared for. And this didn't do very well. This was pretty modest film so i was thinking um, about that before we started the 90s are chock full of just not the greatest movies but just really solid good ones that kind of fall by the wayside maybe you saw them when they're in theaters or when they're on tv and then nobody else did so it's basically forgotten yeah no and and that's because a lot of movies in the 90s they still did that slow gradual release They'd release the movie in a couple of theaters and it would expand. You know, I remember hearing Tom Hanks talk about uh, Big and how that it played for like over a year because they kept just putting it in more and more theaters. And so if you didn't do well in the limited theaters that you had, 
you just didn't get more theaters and you kind of went away. There's a lot of movies, like you say, from the 90s that just kind of disappeared and people had to find them on VHS. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say comments. Uh, we'd appreciate comments, how you feel about the movie. Maybe throw a sub and uh, try to build a little community here, you know. We're, uh, you know, we're trying. Yes, we, um, we're now beginning to whore ourselves out. Ruby land. Please comment. Please subscribe. <laughs> We're begging you. Quite literally, I'm losing my job in like three months. I have four <laughs> kids, two of whom are missing both their legs. <laughs> and they're addicted to heroin. <laughs> I gave it to them. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's a great note to end on. From Rudy Land to your homes, give kids heroin. Thank mm-hmm. you.